So hi, Sue and Caleb. I'm happy to have you both here for um, another interview that I'm that I have been producing for my website and for YouTube um, related to books that are kind of helped along the process that have actually come into completion, come to fruition. And I just got my copy of Breathe in Water yesterday and opened on this morning. And I'm absolutely delighted. I'm sure both of you are incredibly proud of this. And you can see a little scale too. It's just a, a sweet little book with them, um, which I hope we'll kind of explore a little bit of some of the design elements that are in here as well with the um, vellum papers, in the blue thread that's used to sew the book. Absolutely gorgeous. So we're going to kind of start the interview a little bit, interview conversation. And I wanted to sue to start us off talking a little bit about the project and uh, its inception. And then maybe as we kind of go along, maybe your journey into wanting to produce a book of this work. Okay. Hi, my name is Sue Mike Levitz, and I'm honored to be here and have worked with both of you. The three of us are Team Breathe as, as we collaborated to bring this book to fruition and publication. I um, am a photographer. I also work in artist books and mixed media, but I'm relatively new to that world. I spent 45 years in an entirely different career and then entered the world of photography much more seriously than just taking pictures when I was hiking around my kayak. Um, I've been drawn to um, photographing water and abstraction for a number of years. And I think that I believe um, I do that because I like being outside in nature. And water to me um, really is, is vital and is essential for life as is breathing. So when I started to take images that involve more abstraction and more water and being able to see more figures within water, I put together the concept of a body of work that I titled Breathe in Water. Uh, then I had been studying a book art since about um, 2018. I wanted my uh, work to go into a form that people could hold and touch and keep with them and review and not just see in a gallery wall or in one wall in their house. And Putting together books was not new to me. I spent a career um, editing and authoring textbooks, but it's very different than putting together an artist book. So this was has been a new venture for me over the last few years. Yeah. And um, Caleb, do you want to just um, do a little brief introduction to yourself and your work too? And then we'll kind of discuss how team breathe. Uh, well, let's Sue discuss the more of the trajectory of the book and how Team Breathe, how she ended up meeting us and some of the other interesting people she's also worked with along the way. Yeah, sure. So it's been so much fun, like collaborating with both of you, and that's been wonderful. Um, I'm, I sort of came at this through, I guess I was a photographer for a while and photographed ice. So that was a natural connection to, to Sue's book of water, since they both are from the same element. And uh, I used to be a printer. And I printed for a lot of sort of old school photographers, including Mary Ellen Mark and Robert Frank, Ralph Gibson, Lucien Clare, Donna Ferrato. And then the pandemic sort of a lot of that, well, people were getting older, so they go to another planet or another earth or another place. And then the pandemic kind of killed exhibits and things for museums. And so the printing was getting tough. And I've always loved books. And I've been designing one or two books a year. And during the pandemic, I transitioned to a design studio. And I'm now focusing primarily mostly on books. And it's just really wonderful to be able to help the artist to find a visual grammar that can be implemented through the books and the materiality and the typography and the color and the haptic nature of papers. And, and then that you know, helps them to create more impact in their careers and with their work when it gets out into the world. Yeah, haptic nature, that's an interesting term. It's like, that's one I've <laughs> like recently learned uh, relating to apps, but that's interesting where you're talking about like how it actually feels, the tactile, a lot of the tactile qualities, which was actually heavily considered in um, 
Sue's book too, some of the tactile qualities, as well as just the visual qualities too. Sue, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your book arts experience and how that may have informed what you wanted with this book? And then, and then maybe address a little bit about how you discovered Caleb and why you thought he would be great as a designer for this project. Okay, so let me talk first about my background in learning about book arts and artist books. And two, two years ago, I completed an MFA at Main Media Workshops at Main Media College. And during the program, I had the opportunity to take um, uh, a um, book arts class, an introductory one from one of our mentors in the program, Sig Harvey. And I really love playing with the materiality of the papers and the textures and putting colors together, trying to sew papers together, which I was terrible with to begin with. And I decided that um, because I'm a very tactile and visual person, that continuing a journey and working with books would be very helpful. So without, throughout my program, I worked with other people in book arts, with Richard Wright Smith, with Charles Altschul, with um, Joyce Tennyson, and got input from them related to projects that I wanted to work on. Um, one semester I worked with Richard and Charles and, and worked on the first version of Breathe in Water. It was a Japanese stab binding book that I put together. And as you know, if you've done a handmade book, it's, it's very tedious to do that. And it's difficult to produce a lot of copies unless that's all you do in your life and in your day. I decided at that point, at some point in time, as, as the body of work expanded, and I began this body of work in about 2018 or 2018, that I would look at putting the book into a different form. And because I'm essentially a bit of a, a learning nerd, whenever I pick up a book, I take the book, I look at it, and I look at the back at the colophon to see who, who photographed, who directed, who did the design. And this is a book that Patricia Christakis had done. Uh, Patty and I went to school together. And the, it's an exhibition book that goes with her exhibit. I really like the materiality of it, the design of it. So I looked at the back and I saw designed by Calipane Marcus, Luminosity Lab. And I kept that in my mind. I thought I have to get in touch with this person. <clears throat> then I think it was a year and a half ago, Melanie, you were teaching a course for um, Santa Fe workshops on publishing your photography book. Yes. And some of your classmates are probably going to be incredibly excited to see this interview with you. <laughs> we'll have to share it with all of them. Yeah. It was a really great class and it taught me um, aspects of putting together an artist book, obviously, that I've never thought about. It's your expertise, not mine. And then about a month later, there was a call for people to sign up for the um, portfolio reviews for the North in New England portfolio reviews. That is a combination of the Griffin a Museum of Photography and the Photographic Resource Center in Cambridge. And I got the list of people who were reviewers. And bingo, Melanie was on the list and Caleb was on the list. And it's always somewhat of a crapshoot when, when you sign up for people to see who you're going to get. And my first two reviews, or by Caleb and Melanie. Oh, yeah. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I could do some work with them together. I've always spent part of my career as being a connector. So um, I said to them that I would like to work on a book. Would they be interested in working on it? And it went from there. We did a lot of meetings on Zoom. And when it was time to actually think about printing the book, I went to Brooklyn to Caleb's studio to touch papers and to meet him in person. And that's how our project evolved together. And yeah, I'm, you both decided to work with me. Yeah, and we're grateful that you that you have also be, been a connector in this way too, because Caleb and I worked together on a workshop as well, which you sat in on, which was fantastic that you kind of popped in for the day and talked about your experience as well. So, um, so. I mean, it was it was a relatively long journey. I think what what we took. Um, I can't remember from beginning to end because usually when I'm when I'm talking about my workshops and my workshops, people say, "Oh, I want to get a book done within X period of time," and sometimes it seems uh, unreasonable. Uh, and I think we worked together, Caleb. Do you remember when you actually started design work 
on this? Or Sue, do you remember when design started? Sue's like, yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melanie, you and I began working together first on selecting images. I had a pile of uh, 125 four by six images that I had selected mm -hmm. from some of the work that I'd done over the years. And we began first by looking at ones that would be in or out and called it down a bit. I think Caleb, when you came in to working with us um, formally, we probably had about 80 images at that time. And we, we talked about what images may be good to tell the story of breathing in water and about water as a vital form of life and med being meditative and, and restorative. Then uh, we began meeting together mm -hmm. and that occurred over a number of months. And, and part of it had to do with the fact that I couldn't be in a hurry at the time. I had to carefully think about what I was doing, think about budget, because this is not an inexpensive thing to do, by the way, for people who want to put together really nice um, offset printing books. And we met over a number of months Caleb, I came to your studio in November and we went to press in Amsterdam on March 1st and the books wow, arrived yeah. three weeks ago or two but weeks It depends ago. on when you, when you can, uh, when you start the starting line of all of that, it was really, it was relatively fast process considering, um, and one thing too, when looking at images, one thing that I always encourage people to do is to do small printouts. And even with yours, I lived with them for a while. Like, I printed them out just on copier bond and stuck them on the wall and moved them around and um, explored a lot of sequencing and editing. And then there was some stuff that you had come, you had come with some of the images too, with work that you had done with um, Sal Taylor Kid. Yes. And, and there was, there's like a beautiful sequence that uh, Caleb included in here of which was which was very clever, a simple technique, but also just incredibly beautiful of using all the verticals, three verticals on one page, because it almost looked like they were like shot with, you know, one iceberg and one little series of where you just almost turn the camera three different directions in the same space. And it's just it's a little incredibly beautiful sequence of images that were there. Yeah, that one. I think it's just incredible i think it's so beautiful i love the positives and the negatives and um so so yeah but but what i always encourage people to do is to print them out put them up live with them for a while take things down because once we sent what because i did a, a quick mock-up uh just in in design myself and then said yes yeah, share it away with caleb and he probably took some of what sal did i think you may i don't know if you sent him images of images so caleb how did you start working with uh sue's work like what was your working process yeah i mean i think the three of us started in march so it was march, more or less right. one year from you know at least the start of our three our threesome collaboration until uh until it was printed which is I think it's sort of an, a normal amount of time, like a good amount of time, because if things get too long, then sort of the the spark of the idea can get lost sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if they're too short, there's sort of not enough time to fully germinate and sort of see where the idea could go. So I feel like, you know, six months to a year is like a reasonable amount of time that for 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 a book and yeah it did feel fast like we have the book all of a sudden and I feel like we just started yesterday yeah <laughs> yes that's true um, so it's pretty amazing uh, yeah I mean I think every process is different but for us because we had started with these different sequences I think we even began where we were all sequencing if I remember correctly sort of in parallel which is something that I've never done before with three people. So we had these three different sequences and then we would come together and sort of figure out how they could be brought together and what the strengths were. And then we would sort of go back to the board and have another you know, few sets of sequences and bring those back. And it got honed in you know, to a tighter and tighter edit and a stronger and stronger sequence. And of course, this the sequence when it's laid out all in the same size and without, the format of the page is very different. 
because once you introduce the page, all of a sudden you have proportions and what are the relationships between these two images because they're sitting on the same surface. And then there's there's the book and then there's the outside world. And so that changes the, the sequence. So we had to edit, you know, things along that way because we, you know, when we're laying it out on our boards or on our tables, it's not so easy to get three verticals that are going to be proportionate to that page size. Um, but once you start laying it out in InDesign, and then of course all of the proportions and the relationships and, and the white space, you know, how do we activate the white space and make sure that it has energy uh, and it's not just this, you know, empty space. I mean, I, I, I sort of believe there is no empty space, mm -hmm. right? White is a color too, and it's reflecting all colors of light. So like, it's very important to have all of those elements. And mm -hmm. uh, it came together like very naturally. And like, I think the best collaboration is there's no, there isn't friction, right? It's just this very beautiful dialogue and conversation that we carried over, I don't know, six, nine months, however long it was until we had to send the files off. And um, yeah. Well, so um, I, wonder, I wanna bring in one point that I think that um, is really important for artists who are working on books. When you choose to work with a consultant and a designer, for me, it was very difficult to do that all by myself. I, I don't have a, a curation background. I, I can make nice images. I can start to tell a story. But one example of, of using a, a designer mm -hmm. is the way some of the images were paired together on pages. And if I can hold up this example, if you can see that. These two images are two different sizes with some appropriate white space. And the lines across these two images, taking at two different times in two different locations in East Greenland, uh, blend together very well. So these are kinds of lines and, and pairings that from now until 25 years from now, I never would have come up with. So yeah. that is one real advantage to working with the designer <clears throat> who's been in this rodeo before and done a lot of this. Yeah, I think that also the, it's important to emphasize too what you said, Caleb, about white space. I think people think of the white space or sometimes black space or something that, you know, usually, hopefully you don't have a bunch of different colors unless it's very, very intentional. Um, but, but it's a graphic element as well. So, you know, you have to make incredibly wise choices about what does that white space mean equally as much as what does the image mean when you're when you're setting up the design? And I think people don't wrap their head around it's a graphic element. And yeah, so and yeah, and you know, where even if the story, I mean, we're sort of clear, some narratives are very clear, like this is a more traditional narrative, and there are these people involved, and it's telling this story about whatever it is, whether it's political or social, emotional, but everything is telling a story, even if it's only landscapes. And so there's there's a movement and a flow and things can speed up and slow down based on how they're on the page and what images come before and after. And if there's any patterns in terms of color or shape, form. And, and so I think the successful books in terms of the edit and the sequence are really creating that narrative, whether it's from an abstract perspective or a conceptual perspective, but there, there needs to be some kind of movement and flow as we turn the pages of the book. Something needs to happen when we turn those pages um, in order for the book to be successful. And then it becomes an experience and that's what we want. We want to be taken away from our lives for a moment and put into another world. Um, and I think these days, you know, that's what makes, yeah, makes a book successful and, and that it can't be a PDF because if it's a PDF, then we're not taking advantage of the physical world and the materiality of the paper and how does, what's the weight in our hands um, and how does that, because that changes it, right? Like we chose to do a soft cover book with an open spine or Swiss binding and that's very different than it had, if it had been a hardcover book and and there's never a right or a wrong, but it does change the feeling a lot. And it's mm -hmm. something that is subconscious, I think, and that we just pick it up, but it gives us this feeling of the object and of what we expect um, from that object and from that experience. 
Yeah, I, and that's interesting when you talk about the object and the theme. I, I have two points to bring up about this. One is when I started telling people that I was working on a book related to water and the work that I had done across the eastern part of the United States and up in Greenland, they said, oh, is this about climate change? And I said, not directly, because it really um, brings forth the vitality of water and, and how it's important for restoration and for, for relaxation. There have been many wonderful projects that have been done and currently going on about the devastation caused by water and by climate change. So I wanted to go sort of toward the other end of the spectrum to help remind myself and people that there are many positive things about studying and looking at water. Um, and I don't remember the other point right now, I'll come back to it. <laughs> well, um, it was interesting too, because I put together a PDF too, and I saw uh, almost this hero's journey of, of the, the female figure that's, um, that is uh, represented many times throughout the book so that's one thing we could talk about as well when you asked me to do the essay i was like well this is my opportunity to kind of discuss uh her hero's journey and what she thinks of and how what water symbolically metaphorically and literally means to her to the figure that's in there which i saw somewhat as an individual figure, but also as a surrogate for you. So um, I think that that helped to guide and probably like Caleb probably used her as well as somewhat of a grounding figure and almost to create like chapter breaks within the book. Do you both want to talk a little bit about like how you dealt with her and how she was kind of threaded into the ice and water images? I can go first if that's okay. Uh, this is, um, when the sequencing of the book was done, um, we began the book with the photograph as an end page and as the leading page. And then before the title page, introduced the first figure of a woman. And there are four figures of women throughout the book. They are all done in full bleed. They're the only images of the 45 that are done in full bleed. And they are women who really aren't identifiable. You can most likely tell it's a female figure in the water, but we purposely, to go along with the abstraction of the book, kept the figure a little bit more amorphous. And, and I chose the images that I had taken of women that are a bit more amorphous. So people, more people have the opportunity to relate to the person. Um, and one of the features that I was really excited about, or still am excited about, was the, um, the sequence that was done with a woman floating in water and a vellum insert that has an essay or prose that Melanie wrote called um, Water is Life with an over, a vellum overlay. And then you turn the page and you see the rest of the figure. So if you don't mind, I'd just like to read the very last portion of what you wrote, Melanie. Yes, uh, of course, yes. I read it in, in one of the class in the meditation group that I'm with and one of the women got a little teary-eyed, which is really something. Um, water is the fulcrum between vitality and mortality. She knows she can't live without water and she can't live within water. If only she believed she could breathe in water. And it's just beautiful. Apropos. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i know and that's like like i'm i'm very proud to even have my name on in the book but also that little section i think caleb did an incredible job um incorporating a lot of the design elements I, caleb so you do you want to address her a little bit and then i want to get a little into the nitty-gritty of making decisions about a book and how the two of you went about went about making some of those actual like just physicality decisions yeah so i mean i think that as humans we often are really drawn to people and to faces and it starts from the time that we're babies supposedly we can recognize our mother's or father's face from a stranger at a very very 
infantile age. And I think that sort of interest and, and maybe the projection when we see an image with people, we can project a storyline onto it or an emotional content. And so for that reason with photographs, it can be easier for people to relate to portraits or, or images that have people in them. And so I think that here, it's a really nice foil between the people and the landscapes and the, having the, the woman the four, four times. Um, it does bring a lot of vitality and a lot of movement and it, it changes the pace as well. And it happens just enough, but fairly rarely that the books, you can almost forget about them if you've only looked at the book once, even though it's changed your experience, but you still primarily remember the landscapes. But if it was only the landscapes, it would be much flatter and, and the story wouldn't be there as much. So I think that the two together really, you know, really create the experience that exists. And if they were taken away, even though it's only four images, which is roughly 10%, right, of the images. I mean, four out of 40, 44, is that what we said we had? 45, including the 45. end sheet. So 45 images. I mean, if we just remove four, we would have 41 images. It doesn't seem like that would change the book much, and yet it would be drastically different. Um, not for the better, in my belief. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, 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 I think it functions very well to have the two, the two together and sort of spread out. Um, yeah. So something also that it has always um, appealed to me in some of the abstractions <clears throat> that I make or photograph is that I like to look for elements of people or animals within my imagery. And a couple of those are included in the book. And this is one example of an image that you may or not see clearly here uh, on the Zoom screen. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. you're looking at it maybe in reverse. It does look a little different. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a face within the image. And I didn't draw that in there. It was not a person embedded in the ice and water. It's just something that appeared when I started looking at the different imagery. Yeah, and I think that some of my selection and what I include in a show or what I include, include in this book had to do with being able to look at some um, recognition of people within the abstracted images of ice and water. Yeah, we tend, we tend to anthropomorphize, I think, lots of, um, when we do our still lives, sometimes a fire hydrant can be somewhat like, you know, look like a, a solitary human figure standing, standing there. So there's many, I think the still lives can somewhat be portraits too and representational. So that makes sense that that was somewhat attractive. And then whether people see those elements or not, like that one now, I'm sure everyone will go to that image and somewhat look for it. But, um, but yeah, that one, that actually is one of my favorites, I think too. There's a few of my favorites that... It was interesting in the discussion too, because we we would argue for ones that we really liked and wanted to include. And I think for the most part, we all got our favorites included in there. But you know, the expression of um, "kill your darlings" does come up too when you're considering uh, photo book design and sequencing and editing. That sometimes you have to decide to include. Uh, things you may not want to include normally for context, or you may have to take some things out because they don't fit into the narrative, even though they're some of your favorite images. But I think for the most part in this one, which I, I do believe may be rare, you got we got all of our favorites included in the book too. No. And there's and there's something too, you talk about the idea about breathe and water. There's something about the weight of this object too that that uh relates to the title and the theme so i want to talk a little bit about physicality because you made some decisions we talked about the vellum sheets uh that you talked about the end papers which are beautiful and you can see the spine with the thread there and the other element with the vellum is the title page too where you have this kind of shimmery paper, which unfortunately you can't read that well. You can kind of see it a little bit, but this vellum title page. So we kind of went through a lot of, um, which I think is just beautiful, Caleb. And then Caleb decided on this font. Do both of you want to kind of discuss a little bit about 
some of the elements in this book and how you made these decisions, uh, especially as it relates to a learning experience for anyone else? Sure. I, I think that um, something that I had, uh, I put my foot in the sand in the beginning, I really wanted a hardcover book. I, I'm used to hardcover books and textbooks. I was upset when my textbook then went into a softcover in the fifth edition. And I thought, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want a softcover. And I also wanted a book that was small that people could hold and it would be intimate and they'd want to touch the pages. And I didn't want the images to go into the gutter. I wanted to be able to see the full image. So in order to do that, one of the designs is, um, is um, the Swiss binding that was used where the pages lie flat. And in order to do that with a small number of pages in this book, the 78 pages and 45 images, it, there had to be a soft cover. It would have been too bulky if it had been designed with the hard cover. I also wanted papers that people wanted to touch. And when people look at my book now, they, some of them apologize. They say, oh, my hands are clean, but I want to touch the pages. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to do, which is why I went, one of the reasons I went to Brooklyn to Caleb Studio to be able to touch the papers. And I want people to be able to touch and look and want to go back and look at it, the book again to study some of the abstractions. So that was, my thinking and as part of the design without a clue how I was going to do that. Caleb? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think for me, you know, we sort of spoke about creating experiences and how are those created? And it's basically, there's a few elements which we can use, um, which are, you know, the materiality, what are the materials of the book? you know, what's the typographic approach? What's the color um, in addition to the form and the proportions that we sort of talked about? And, and water doesn't feel, I mean, I guess the ice is stiff, but because it's bent in these forms and the color, it never feels that stiff to me. Uh, and so having, having a soft cover book feels more fluid and more flexible and malleable because water can go through all of these amazing states, right? It can be liquid, it can be steam or vapor, and it can be ice. And yet all those three forms are water. So it has this malleability to it. And I think having some of that flexibility in, in the physicality of the book is really nice. And then whenever I work on, I mean, any of the projects, like a big portion is sort of typographic research because typography is really, you know, creating an identity. And for brands, it's creating a brand. And for a photographer, what is a book? It's one of the most important parts of, of your brand, right? It can get exhibits. It's this amazing opportunity for press, which lasts for, you know, pretty solidly for a year. Whereas when you do an exhibit, you have an opportunity for press for maybe a month. You know, you're lucky, but it's this very short time frame. And then it lives on bookshelves you know, for as long as we're alive and longer. And who knows who will see this and see the images and see the work and see the story of the photographer through, through this device. And be, when so much thought and attention and detail is put into a book and it's really well crafted and considered, you know, it can really have this big impact. Um, and so for this book, like for the typography, I spent a lot of time trying to find something that would feel like when we hold our breath or we're under the water and we're holding our breath. And there's that moment when you start feeling the compression of the water, the air is running out, you know, you're gonna gasp. You wanna see how long you can make it. And then you come up to the top of the water. And so the typography for me, it felt like it really needed to be something that echoed that. And so through this compression and these tight letters and these long forms of the book, which you can kind of see maybe, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the letter forms are very high and very narrow and very tight. Um, you know, that really creates a lot of the experience. And had we laid that out in some classical but beautiful typeface, you know, let's take Helvetica that everybody knows, which is, you know, an amazing typeface, 
it, it wouldn't have conveyed any of that. Um, and the cover, the cover only has the photograph and type. So, so if you take away that really attention to detail and the research into the typography and how that's echoed, uh, echoing the work, then sort of the, the experience goes away too. And then we have the materiality. And again, with the vellum papers, it's not only a similar color to the water, but it, we also have this translucence. And so with water, we can look through it, but it's not totally transparent. It's partly opaque, but it's mostly mostly uh, translucent. And we can see, depending on the color of the water, the clarity of the water, how far we can see through it. And so on that title page or on those essay page pages, like we can see what's underneath, but it's being colored in the same way that water would color something once it gets depth and it's cover coloring it with sort of a blue or in this case, a cyan. And so looking for those relationships, I think is really relationships to the work from the visual language and the visual grammar to the work is really important. And is what, you know, creates something in my mind that's successful. I think we, we also spent a lot of time going back and forth on the type and the typeface. Mm -hmm and what color it would be on the cover. We started out with black originally, and then uh, Caleb um, came up with the idea of using a foil stamp that's a clear foil stamp to allow the colors of the book to come through. And also when you're in different light, the different colors appear within the breathe and water. We also spent time on the going back and forth about the height of the letters and the kerning of the letters, how far apart they were. Um, we all knew it said breathe in water, and it was a little more compressed when it first started. And I had showed it to a couple of other people. They said, well, I can't really read it. And when you have a mental imprint of what you have had designed, and you know what it is, you can see what it is. But a lot of attention had to be paid into what other people could read and see. And it was very successful in doing that. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So the, the, uh, Ink on the cover, Caleb, that's just a, a like a varnish. It's not even, does it have color to it? Because it does, it's quite iridescent. It does pick up lots of color. Um, yeah, it's a hot foil. Oh, okay. So it does have a little shine to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it is it's a gorgeous choice. And then why the size? You you had a lot of experience with this particular size, Caleb. Was it because we could print? more pages per sheet or what was what was yeah. your thoughts behind yeah this? i mean i guess the two main considerations with size i mean the most important is getting the right size for for, for the book but then within that there's you know the constraints of how many pages can you fit on a sheet because they're printed on you know these large sheets uh and so and you know, technically you get like eight up on, on a sheet, 16, 32, 64 pages up. And the more that you get up, obviously the more cost effective it is. And so you're left with these sort of general sizes that you can't, you know, if you go, if you make a book half an inch bigger, it suddenly is half as efficient. Um, and so for a medium sized book, which is what I would sort of call this, you have the width sort of like a maximum width and then the height can be a little more variable. And that height is what gives it sort of the proportions. And it's also going to give it a lot of the flavor of the book or the, the, the feeling um, when you're looking at it or feeling it in your hand. So, so the width was basically, you know, the maximum width was determined by the technicality of how many you can fit on a sheet. And we knew we didn't want a smaller book. And so at that medium size, that often happens. Like you use the maximum width and then the height is proportional. You brought up the, um, the, the fact of the big sheets that were printed and how certain number of pages have, uh, images have to fit on the page. When I visited you in November, we were talking about what steps go next. And, and you said to me, well, you can go to Amsterdam and go on press. And I thought, oh, I could do that. And I decided to do that. And it ended up being a marvelous experience being there to look at the sheets as they came out. And on one on the first occasion when the sheets were printed, we did some color correction right on the spot, which is really a benefit to being able to be there to see what's going on and not to direct what's going on, but to learn about what's going on and to work with the master printers who were there. 
The other bonus was I happened to score tickets to the Vermeer exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> But it was right. wonderful. It was, a little. <laughs> it was wonderful to be able to go through the whole process. The process that I did not experience was at the bindery, where the pages are cut, folded, sewn, and the covers are put on. Because that was done a week after I left. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sue. I was going to ask you to, to talk about that a little bit. And also, you are going to do a lengthier piece on that with lens scratch, I believe, isn't that correct? And that'll be sometime really soon. Um, I have to finish sending it in to Aline and I believe it will appear sort of toward the third or fourth week in May. Okay, and we'll put a link to that too. I'll put a link to that for the YouTube so people could follow up and learn more about that experience too. And, and, the, other, and the other thing about doing the book, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, but no. I did. Um, <laughs> another another important part is once you have the book, how do you get it out there? And um, you, it's like if you're selling your house, you have to put a sign up and have a realtor or, or represent yourself. You can't just expect people to knock on your door and say, I'd really like the book. So I started working on opportunities to um, get the book in different places. On um, June 2nd, I'm doing a signing at a small boutique bookstore in Rockland, Maine. And then in um, what's the in name? Arctic Turn. Okay. <laughs> and it sort of fits with the flow of the book. It, it's a well curated <laughs> small mm -hmm. bookstore. Sal Taylor Kid has her work in that store. Uh, and so do I. I uh, so will I. And then in August, I'm doing a talk at the Rockport Library. And I'll have the book there with during the talk. Um, it's going to go into a small museum's bookstore in the fall. So there are just different opportunities that you have to ask for and try to work with. I have an, I have an exhibit that opens to the Maine Jewish Museum on June 29th. It's a museum in Portland, Maine. And the book will be there as part of the exhibit with 27 images. So you just you can't just say, oh, people are going to come and buy this book. Yeah. And, and you I, also have to have it on your website, too. <laughs> and with it's a great on, page it's on, on my website and it's being modified <laughs> tomorrow morning because there are all sorts of considerations you know how do you how do you sell the book right behind me are two of the two of the eight boxes or six boxes of books that were shipped from amsterdam and the worst nightmare that any artist has is oh my goodness in three years these boxes are going to be sitting in my garage what am i going to do with these books am i going to give them out as party favors so that's a real consideration. And, and Melanie, you address that very well in the classes that you teach. Thanks. Yeah. And then just getting together, we, we're working on now kind of getting together press releases, making sure your web page is up and going, that you're keeping track of <clears throat> correspondence, figuring out like tangentially who you can, because a lot of people think of this normal a chain of uh, distribution, maybe like with bookstores and places like that. But like you are just, for instance, when you mentioned you read that last line of the essay to your yoga group, your yoga group, great place for something like this to be, or places that deal in meditation or, you know, alternative therapies. Are, are there other locations where you can have your work? Mm -hmm. The Jewish Museum, considering your, your relationship there, you know, there's so many places where um, you can put your book out there in the world, but then you've got to do it. You've got to do the work and they've got to track the work. And then, um, we're going to this uh, i wanted to try, keep the interview to a little bit of a link but there's two other things that i kind of want you to discuss so i'll throw them out maybe for both of you but sue i want you to talk about a little bit about the limited editions that you're going to do and and some of the considerations for that uh, i i would love to eventually get into budget but that might be a little bit too much for us for this point and then i just want to finish maybe with if you were to have done something differently during this course, what would that be? So if so, if you want to start kind of with the limited edition, if you want to throw in some budget there, that's great. And then tell me about the good, the good and the bad, like what you really, really loved or what would be considered a mistake. <laughs> so if if we process. talk about budget and, and considerations, uh, I d my goal is to be able to cover a high percentage of the cost of putting the book together. 
printing it, having a design consultant, um, uh, an editorial consultant. Because when you put together a book like this, you don't do it to make money. I mean, as, as I joke, my former career paid me to do uh, what I did and I got paid well. My new career, I pay to do right now, yeah. pay to play. <laughs> And, and if I have a show and I sell enough images to cover my printing and framing, I'm just ecstatic. Mm -hmm. But um, in order to get the book out there and, and to um, provide a couple of different tactile and visual opportunities, there are three versions of the book or the way I'm selling the book. One is the book by itself. The other is the book with a limited edition print and we're doing 50 of those. And the, the print will fit within the book. And the third is um, a, a deluxe edition of three of eight to 10 of the books, which will be in a custom box that will come with two images under the book wrapped in a vellum. And then one image chipped into the front part of the clamshell box and a very small image on the front of the box. And that's more of a collector's item. There are people who collect artist books and, and keep them intact. The images that I'm including within the book are not ones that I intend pe to people to take out of the box and then frame. They're more as, a, as an object of the book with small prints. So did that answer that question? Yes, yeah, that, and, and, and there, there's more, there'll be more details on your website too, which I hope will be like an incredibly wonderful, informative page that will make someone want to buy one of the three options of this beautiful book. So, um, and then do you want to talk about uh, maybe both of you, like lesson learned with this one, if there was such a thing uh, or, you know, or something that you may do differently? And if it's nothing, then fantastic. <laughs> but is there something that you might do differently? Pay more attention to budget maybe, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And fortunately I had some money saved because I had a job that paid me. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because Caleb, I found an interview that you did uh, a number of years ago and people asked you, you were asked questions by the interviewer and then you answered and somebody mm -hmm. said, well, as a photographer, how do you be successful? And he said to have a partner <laughs> who has a lot of money. <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, I have I, I couldn't do a book like this twice a year because I'd have to recoup some of the finances to be able to do that. I don't mind having spent the money on the book because I feel really good about the product. Other people will get to enjoy it. And it also, um, as someone had mentioned earlier, the caliber Melanie, it gets your name out there. Mm -hmm. Kelly mentioned that you do an exhibit, it's here today, gone tomorrow. With a book, more people have the opportunity to have um, your work than they do from an exhibit. I don't think 200 people are going to buy one print from an exhibit. Hopefully, if a few people buy prints, that'll be great. But 200 people could buy the book mm -hmm. and, and have a piece of my work with them. Yeah. And I think books also are just engaged with in such a different way. If you go over to someone's home and it happened, you know, you see a print on the wall, maybe you comment on it, but it kind of is here and gone. But if the book is on a table or on a bookshelf and somebody happens to pull it out, like all of a sudden they've now engaged with you as an artist because it's sort of a more complete part of your thought process that they've seen than an individual print. And then they, they also now have read your name, which means that they're more likely to remember it or if they come across it in five years, they're like, wait, I think I know this person. And so I think it really, you know, books can make ripples that go down the road for many years. Um, I know when I was doing my own photography practice, sometimes somebody would, I think even five years later after I did my book on ice that I'd get a contact, hey, I, you know, I have your book, I saw your book. And so, you know, things can just happen. And that's sort of wonderful. Um, for the artists, I think. Yeah, thanks, Caleb. Any last comments from both of you? Thank you for, provide, for, for providing this opportunity. I didn't say that very well. Thank you for providing the opportunity. 
to of do course. that. I hope, I hope it works well for both of you, but also I hope that people gain a lot of information from it too. In addition to it being a conversation, I try to, we try to pack it with, a, <laughs> with some applicable information as well. And um, will you tell me both your website addresses so we can just include it as part of the video now? SueMikeLivitz.com, my name. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Luminosity Lab. Um, and it was, you know, just such a wonderful collaboration. And I think, you know, we'll know each other for many years. And that's really nice to sort of meet more wonderful people and to make beautiful books together, which I think we have definitely done. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy that, that we work together. Well, thanks. Sorry. Thank you both so much. Yeah. And it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you. And um, thank you very much.